And now stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who is guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, The Whistler's Strange Story, The Witness. Like so many people, Paul Kilburn was his own worst enemy. He had brilliance, charm, and youth, and he never let anyone forget it. When he graduated from college, he received the American Award for the most promising student of architecture at Andover University, and he never let anyone forget that either. Yes, Paul Kilburn had a lot to learn, and as an assistant in the architectural firm of Joseph Abercrombie and Company, he was given the opportunity to learn but he refused to accept it. Now, for the third time that week, Paul strode defiantly into the company offices, giving plain evidence of his resentment and his third hangover of the week. Paul. Yeah? Mr. Abercrombie's been looking for you. Has he found me yet? You're an hour late. An hour and a half late. You'd better think up some story for him. I did the best I could. A uh, little miss cover-up. Everybody's office, pal. Don't you ever get tired of being grand, Edith? Paul, be quiet. And tell Mr. Amber Crombie Mr. Kilburn is here and happy to confer with him at any time. I'm free now, Mr. Kilburn, if that's convenient with you. Perfectly. Perfectly. After you, Mr. Abercrombie. Sit down, Paul. All right. I'm tired of warning you, Paul. This is the third time this week. And before that... No, I'm just lost. And if I don't mend my ways in the future, I won't have a future. Isn't that the way it goes? You don't have a future now, Paul. Not with us. You're fired. I'm what? Fired. You're the most promising member of our staff. There's no question about that, but I think we can manage without you. When you lose some of your egotism and replace it with some sense of responsibility, come back and see us. <laughs> You didn't expect that, did you, Paul? Joseph Abercrombie and Company was to be a mere stepping stone for you. A lull before the storm of success. But not now. You keep up your front of careless indifference, even when Edith insists that the two of you go out for a cup of coffee together. But inside, you feel like a whipped schoolboy, don't you, Paul? Oh, Paul, what are you going to do? You tell me. I... I feel awkward. Why? I'm the one who got fired. I... I just do, Paul. I've watched your work. You're going to be a great architect. Well, it's too bad you didn't reach Abercrombie with that news. I know I'm acting like a schoolgirl on her first date. Yeah, well, uh, what are you trying to say? It's hard for me, Paul, because, well, we've only gone out once or twice, and you've been so distant. Oh, no harm meant. I know. Look, Paul... I've inherited $20,000. $20,000? Oh. I wish I had your luck. You have. Uh, come again? 20000 is enough for you to open an office of your own and keep going until you make it on your own, Paul. Yeah, but what about you? Where, where do you come in? Anywhere you say. You can consider it a loan or make me a partner in the firm. I can handle the office end. Yeah, but, but why take a chance on me? I'm not very steady. I've slept through an alarm clock ever since I was in long pants. <laughs> I never sleep through an alarm clock, and I never forget to set it either. I'll phone you every morning and get you up. No, no, it's too good. Why? 
What else do I have to do for this backing? Nothing, except to stop drinking. My offer goes as I made it. I'm talking about you. Don't you want anything more out of this? Well, yes, I do. What? You. I want to marry you, Paul. When you hear a commercial on the radio, you naturally assume it was written by some advertising man, don't you? Well, frankly, friends, the best commercials about Signal Ethel are written by you drivers yourselves. Here's what I mean. All I have to do is spend a little time around a signal station. Pretty soon in drives the owner of a shiny new car who boasts, that signal Ethel sure brings out all the pep and power they build into these new high compression motors. Well, answers the owner of a 42 model, this baby may not be new, but it sure runs like it with signal Ethel. Then a tourist who had stopped for one of signal's free maps chimes in, the thing I like about Signal Ethel is the way it takes me over these big western hills without shifting or clattering. Well, the only trouble, friends, is that there isn't room in one commercial for all the enthusiastic things drivers say about the premium grade of Signal's famous go-farther gasoline. To discover them all, you'll simply have to try a tank full of this super-powerful super fuel, which is the best idea anyway. Try a tank full. Then let its performance in your car write the best commercial you've ever heard about Signal Ethel. You meet Edith just about halfway, don't you, Paul? You let her set you up in business all right, and you become engaged. But you conveniently put off the marriage to some future date, or, as you tell Edith, until you've proved yourself worthy of all she's done for you. And as time goes by, you're forced to admit that she has a wholesome influence on you. Your drinking stops. You adopt regular habits. But the instantaneous success you expected as an architect comes very slowly, doesn't it, Paul? Well, how about it, Mr. Crawford? What do you think of these plans? Young man, if there weren't a young lady present, I'd tell you exactly what I think of them. Why, what do you mean, Mr. Crawford? I mean, to be blunt, that these plans you drew up, Kilburn, are utterly worthless as far as I'm concerned. Now, wait a minute. And if this is your idea of what I need, then, young man, I don't need you. Good day, sir. But, Mr. Crawford... Ah, oh, let him go. But... All right, Paul. And don't worry, darling. We'll do this thing yet, together. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kilburn. I, I don't like to go into this on the phone, but these plans of yours just won't do. So far, I see no indication that you want to incorporate anyone's idea except your own. Well, if you have such hot ideas of your own, why did you come to me in the first place? That's odd, Mr. Kilburn. I was just about to ask myself the same question. Why the... Oh, Paul, you, sh you shouldn't get so angry. You shouldn't... I don't need guys like that. Yes, you do, darling. We both need them. A lot of them. And somehow we'll get them, too. For the first time in your life, you begin to know what hard work is, don't you, Paul? You have to work hard. And Edith, beside you every step of the way, works even harder than you do. Nights, days, weekends... Until finally someone says the words you've waited to hear. Well, sir, Mr. Kilburn... I've seen everything. Is there, is there anything I missed, Mr. Benson? Oh, no, no, not a thing, Kilburn. This is a work of art. You're a fine architect and an, an excellent architect. We're, we're so glad you're pleased, Mr. Benson. Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing. If this is a sample of your work you'll never want for clients, if I can help it, I'm happy I had sense enough to hire you. And that's just the beginning, isn't it, Paul? The Benson contract was a big one. And from that, others began to come in. After a while, you become used to the idea of success. That's easy, isn't it, Paul? But getting used to the idea of marrying Edith one day is something else again. But you don't really want to lose Edith completely. She's so convenient. 
still phones you every morning to get you up, takes care of all sorts of annoying details at the office. Even you have to admit she's a big part of your success. But you can't put her off indefinitely, can you, Paul? And one afternoon about a month later, as Edith comes into your workroom, you have no way of knowing that the time of decision is near at hand. Someone to see you, Paul. Shall I tell her to wait? Her? Patricia Wilson. Never heard of her. Everyone else has. She's a tobacco heiress. Just flew in from Rome a few weeks ago. And she's very pretty. Oh, money and beauty. Both, I'm sorry to say. Oh, by the way, I'm sending your drawings to the International Society of Architects and Designers competition. Okay, if you say so. Nothing to lose and 10000 to gain. To say nothing of all the honors. No, suit yourself. And you can send that tobacco heiress in. Oh, I'm in, Mr. Kilburn. I'd have been in earlier if I'd known that geniuses come so young and so handsome. Well, I'd have come out, Miss Wilson, if I'd had any idea the tobacco leaves had such a lovely flower. <laughs> we'll get on. Excuse me. Oh, of course, Edith. Uh, sit down, Miss Wilson. I will. Now I know I want you to design me a house. That's good. Yes, it is. And I know exactly what I want. And architecture is one of my hobbies. Oh, can't you leave the architecture to me? Well, what would I do for a hobby, Mr. Kilburn? Find another one. Like, uh, horseback riding, say. When? Well, let's see now. Excuse me, Paul. Yes, what is it? The contractor at Silver Lake House is on the phone. It's about some trouble with the peg flooring. Why trouble? There's nothing to putting that in. Perhaps you'd better talk with him, Paul. No, not now. Tell him... Uh, well, uh, tell them I'll be out there right away. All right, Paul. I'll call the parking lot and have them send your car Yes, around. yes, do that. I'm uh, sorry, Miss Wilson. Not at all. I like spirit in my architects. Well, this contractor's always telling me something can't be done. I know all about pegged floors. Practically put them in my house by myself. Uh, now, uh, where were we? You just suggested horseback riding, and I just asked when. But I'm going to take back my question. Oh? Mm -hmm. Make a statement out of it. We'll go riding Sunday, Paul. Patricia's very sure of herself, isn't she, Paul? And that's Sunday, and the next and the next, when it isn't horseback riding, it's golf, or the races at Del Mar, or dinner and dancing. It's always something, and it's always Patricia. You see Edith less and less. It's good business, you tell her. Patricia's wealthy, and she knows everyone worth knowing. Edith never says anything, and you push her hurt, suffering looks to the back of your mind. But Patricia's not so generous with her. <laughs> oh, oh, that was wonderful. Yeah, yeah, it was great. You won again. Oh, of course, darling, I always win. Didn't you know that? I've wondered. Oh, well, maybe not always at that. For instance, are you still engaged to that little mouse of a secretary of yours? Technically. Why? I told you why before. I don't appreciate having that plain little creature as a rival. Winning over her would be an empty victory, and losing would be unbearable. Well, what do you want to win? You don't know? I don't think so. Oh, now you're being insulting. Maybe. How do I know you haven't pulled this off in Rome, or Paris, or London? Pulled what off? A victory, and then left the sap holding his hand. <laughs> You're not far wrong. Well, well, I don't intend to be another sap. <laughs> You're not going to be. Does that mean you'll marry me? Yes. When? As soon as you break off with that little secretary of yours. No, I, I, I've told you. I'll let her down as soon as I could. I better be very soon. I don't like waiting. <laughs> You try, Paul, but you can't bring yourself to do it. Too many people know how much Edith has helped you when you were down and out. And besides, deep down, you're too much of a coward to tell her the truth. And on Monday morning, you come into the office late with a hangover. Good morning, Paul. Hello, Edith. I warn you, I'm about to do something I never did before. Yeah, what? I'm going to kiss you right here in this office. Oh, no, please, Edith, no. Stop it. All right. Maybe I should have told you about the telegram before I tried to kiss you. What, the telegram? Yes. Listen. Mr. Paul Kilburn, congratulations. The International Society of Architects and Engineers is pleased to announce that your designs have been selected as the most original and creative in the field of architecture. You have been named the Society's Architect of the Year. The award will be made officially on Sunday, July 15th at the Stratton Club in a banquet to be tendered in your honor. H.M. Wakefield, President. 
Do I get that kiss? Yeah. Oh, Paul. I'll be so proud when I watch them present you with the diamond pin and the $10,000 at the banquet. Of course. I'm sure you will. I know, Paul. It's all over the papers. Congratulations, darling. Thanks, Patricia. Oh, I've been a busy girl. Rush down to Antoine's to have myself fitted for a new gown. Wait till you see it the night of the banquet. You shouldn't have done that. Why not? I'm taking Edith to the banquet. I have to. No, you're not. Now, be reasonable, Patricia. You know I love you. I tell you, there's nothing I can do. All right. I'll let your little Edith play Cinderella for one night, but after that, Paul, you're going to get rid of her. And I mean rid of her. She's not going to be your secretary or anything else. Is that clear? Yes, I promise you. She'll go. The banquet is a gala affair. You and Edith are in the seats of honor at the first table. And at the next table, staring coldly at you, Patricia with some obscure architect. And as if further irony were needed... Your former employer, Joseph Abercrombie, is selected as Toastmaster. You're completely miserable, aren't you, Paul? In a few minutes, you'll be presented with $10,000 and the highest honors of your profession. And you wish you were a thousand miles away. You take your usual form of escape, don't you, Paul? A waiter, another whiskey and water, please. Please, Paul, darling, no more. You called for me in your car, remember? You can drive if you think I've had too much. Ladies and gentlemen, before we officially present the award to the Architect of the Year, I'd like to tell you something about this year's winner. I, I know him very well. I had the honor, if I can use that word, of being the only man to have fired him. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that he proved himself a better man than I. <laughs> Before I say any more about him, however, I would like to pay homage to the woman behind the throne. It was her financial and moral backing through thick and thin that made Paul Kilburn what he is today. And she is soon to become his wife. I want Edith Kramer to stand up and take a bow. Thank you. Thank you very much. I shall always remember this night. You can see Patricia's eyes staring at you from the next table. They're ablaze with hatred. And there's nothing you can do but sit there and smile mechanically. You're called to the rostrum where the diamond pin is clipped onto your lapel. And you receive the check for $10,000. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Patricia is at your side. I'm not waiting any longer, Paul. Finish with her tonight. Please don't drive so fast. Look, you told me to go ahead and drive. Now don't tell me how to do it. All right, dear. Let's be happy tonight. It's such an important night, Paul. Oh, you're so blind, Edith. Can't you see it's over? Is it? You know it is. Oh, Paul, I... Oh, stop that. You're the one who's blind, Paul. Don't you see she'll ruin you? In a month, you'll be a drunkard and a bum. I'll take my chances. If you leave me for that... that Patricia, I swear I'll tell everyone... If that's the only way I can hold you, I'll make you look so cheap, you... You hear me? Oh, oh, oh. oh stop it, Edith. That's not going to help. Paul! Paul, I thought the car! Are you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess so. Come on, let's get out of here. But, Paul, the other car, there's a man lying on the road. Yeah, I see him. Maybe he needs help. Edith, come back here, Edith. He's not moving. Get back in the car. He's dead, Paul. I'm sure he is. Did you see anybody else? No, but it's dark. Any other cars? No. That's no, a break. Not this thing will only start. Come on. Come on. Come there. Gas station just around the bend. We can call the police. Police? From there and... Are you insane? Manslaughter and liquor on my breath? But Paul. You can't do anything for him. 
You said he was dead. A thousand thoughts race through your mind as you drive Edith home. Somehow, you manage to get her car in the garage without being seen. And as you stand with Edith at her front door before walking to the corner cab stand, Edith gives you something else to think about. Someday you'll forgive me for loving you so much, Paul. Oh, no, no. Not now, Edith. I can't think You're I going could... to forget about Patricia. Because I won't give you up now, Paul. Ever. What? What, what is this? I wouldn't do this if it were just for me. But it's for you, too. I'm a witness, Paul. The only witness to the accident. So? We're going to get married, Paul. Soon. She means it, doesn't she, Paul? All the way home in the taxi, you think how much she means it. Inside your own home, a swirl of thoughts engulf you. The accident. Edith. Patricia. Drunk driving. Hit and run. Patricia. Edith. An hour passes. Two. Then one thought emerges clear and demanding, and you know what you must do. It's Paul, Edith. I want you to come over right away. Oh, what happened? Uh, nothing. We're going to be married, that's all. Paul, it's three in the morning and you... I'm what? fine. I'll just throw a few things in the bag and grab a cab and come over. I'll pack my bag and by the time you get here, we'll take my car and drive oh, south. darling. Oh, my. What's wrong? I just remembered. You have a nine o'clock appointment with Mr. Healy in the morning. I've got my alarm clock set for seven, so I'll be sure and get you up. Edith, for heaven's sake. Oh, Oh, all right, darling. Forgive me. I, I'm not quite awake. And this is sudden. Oh, Paul, darling, I'll hurry. I came as soon as I could, Paul. I hope you haven't changed your mind. No, Edith. I haven't changed my mind. Oh, Paul... Paul, I'm so happy. I... Oh, no. You work quickly, just as you'd planned it, Paul. Hurriedly drill the wooden pegs out of three of the heavy oak planks in your floor. Push them aside and stuff Edith's body in her suitcase into the 18-inch clearance underneath. This will do for now, won't it, Paul? Until you have more time to safely dispose of the body. You replace the planks. Hammer in some new pegs. Then you reach for the phone. I want the police department, please. Police headquarters? This is Paul Kilburn, number four, Linwood Lane. Yes. My fiancée is missing. Edith Kramer. She dropped me off at my house about 11. Said she was going straight home. I've been trying to reach her ever since. No one answers. I can't imagine what's happened to her. Would you please? My number is East Hills 49283. With cars costing as much as they do today and the future supply of new ones uncertain, most all drivers are interested in ways to make their cars last. And there's no better way to make your car last than to reduce engine wear due to lubrication 50% with amazing new Signal Premium Motor Oil. Just consider what a 50% reduction in engine wear can mean to you. With new Signal Premium, your car should keep its like new pep and power twice as long should go twice as many miles before needing an overhaul due to engine wear. If your car isn't already an oil eater, new Signal Premium should double the period during which you'll continue to enjoy low oil consumption. And get this, you can enjoy all these extra benefits of this superior quality heavy-duty type oil at no increase in price at Signal stations. 
So if you want to keep your car's performance up and expenses down for a long time to come, you know the oil to change to. New Signal Premium. You know where to get it at friendly, independently operated Signal service stations. Well, Paul, it's all over, isn't it? Edith Kramer's dead, her body hidden temporarily beneath the floor in your living room. You've reported her absence to the police in the hope that their search for her will lead them to her car in the garage, the one you were driving when you killed a man late tonight. It's Edith who will appear guilty, isn't it, Paul? Yes, you're sure now that Edith's hold over you is gone. And as the hours pass, you find yourself thinking of Patricia and the life of luxury the two of you will share while you patiently await word on Edith's disappearance. Finally, it comes. I'm Lieutenant Nicholas. You're uh, Paul Kilburn? Oh, that's right. Come in, Lieutenant. Have you found her? No, not yet. But I'd like to. Looks like she killed a man last night. What? Hit and run accident. E Edith? Oh, that's impossible. Well, we found her car in her garage. It looks like an accordion. It's the car, all right. Oh, but where is she? Skipped out. At least her bedroom looks like it. But we'll find her, and we'll have you to thank for it when we do. Me? Yeah, if you hadn't reported her missing, we'd never have found her car. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, what time do you have now? Now, uh, just about 7 o'clock. Yeah, it's been a long night, hasn't it? Mind if I use your phone? No, no, not, not at all. What's that? Uh, my alarm clock in the bedroom. Oh, it doesn't sound like it. Wait a minute. Oh, it's right here, under the floor. I'm standing over it. The suitcase. What's that? that nothing, nothing at all. What's an alarm clock doing under your floor? Well, you, you see, I... I believe I'll just find out for myself, Mr. Kilburn. Oh, Sergeant. Yes, Lieutenant? Come in, will you? I want you to help me tear up some floorboards. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. And before you start your vacation trip, be sure to ask your signal dealer for a free copy of Lane's Guide, a booklet prepared by an independent travel organization to help you find good eating and lodging places. While no pocket-sized booklet can include all the good hotels, motels, and dining places, Lane's Guide covers a representative selection in hundreds of cities and towns. And a copy of this handy publication is yours free at Signal Stations. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, High Aberback, Eve McVeigh, Betty Lou Gerson, John Daner, and Jess Kirkpatrick. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Meyer Dolinsky, music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember to tune in at this same time next Sunday, when the Signal Oil Company will bring you another strange story by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. Stay tuned now for the Horace Height Show which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>